Hi everyone, welcome to the next Images Decoded and uh, also giving you an update before I begin with this session. All of you know that Monday to Friday we are having trio classes nowadays. So what is the trio classes? So every Monday to Friday, this is the uh, scheduler for the coming week. So from 23rd to 27th of October, we have three classes in a day. The first one is early morning, the kickstart morning session at 7.30 a.m. This is on the app. Then in the afternoon, the post lunch session that we have at 3 o'clock for half an hour. This is for the FMG students specially. So this is a crash course that is going on. And then daily from Monday to Friday on the YouTube channel at 9 o'clock we talk about images. So today we have images of respiratory path and then this is these are the different images that we'll be discussing in the coming week. We'll be talking about two classes of renal. We'll have a mixed bag image based question session. We'll have all the different ovarian tumors and we'll also be practicing MCQs based on those ovarian tumor images. Well, having said that, let's begin with the session for the day. So today's session is about respiratory path. And the first thing that I want to start off with is the lining of the respiratory epithelium. So the lining of the epithelium is the pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium. So everyone, I think, can appreciate these cilia extremely well. And yes, that is how we... Uh, you know, identify the respiratory epithelium. However, the entire respiratory tract doesn't have this, right? I hope everyone remembers that in the respiratory tract, there are two areas. Every play, everywhere there are cilia present, but there are two areas where this epithelium is not followed and one of them is the vocal cord. I hope you remember in the vocal cord, the lining epithelium is the squamous epithelium, right? And the other one is the image shown to you and those are the alveoli. In the alveoli, we have cells which are known as pneumocytes. We have cells which are known as pneumocytes, right? So when I talk about pneumocytes, how many types of pneumocytes do we see out here? Type 1 and type 2. Type 1 is the predominant one. This is present in 95% of population. And type 2 out of all, only 5% of the cells are type 2 pneumocytes. So most of the really flat looking cells out here, these are all type 1 pneumocytes. Most of the flat nuclei are type 1 pneumocytes. So majority cells are type 1. Whereas a little plump nuclei that you have, those are type 2. So you can hardly see one or two of those, right? They are less in number. They are only 5% of the cell population. So these are not ciliated. The alveoli, these empty, empty air-filled alveoli, they are lined by pneumocytes type 1 as well as type 2. Having done this, not just the epithelium, we must look at all the layers also that we have. So when we look at the layers of the respiratory tract, like we have the layers of the GIT, right? One we have is a mucosa, the next we have is the submucosa, then in the GI tract we have something known as the muscle layer. However, here what we have is known as the cartilage. So please remember, let me repeat for all of you. Here we have the mucosa. Mucosa has ELM. What is ELM? Epithelium, which you've already told me, the ciliated epithelium. ELM, after epithelium, we have lamina propria and then the muscularis mucosi. So see, this is the epithelium. Below the epithelium, this loose tissue that you have over here, this becomes the lamina propria and then you have a muscle layer that is known as muscularis mucosi. Okay, having said that this is all about mucosa. So the mucosa has three layers ELM. After that we have submucosa. So you can see the submucosa over here and in the submucosa you can see some mucus glands as well. So there are glands present in the submucosa. Then you have a little bit of muscle and cartilage. So you can see all that blue color cartilage out here and that's the outermost layer. Having said that, this is all about the normal, right? Now let's go on to a little bit of pathology. So the first pathology that I'm going to put up in front of you is emphysema. I think everyone knows emphysema is an irreversible condition in which we are going to have all dilated air spaces. So very well you can identify that the air spaces out here are extremely big and dilated. So you can see this really huge dilated one over here. Then you can see a dilated one over here. And if you try to another one over here, 
if you try to look inside these air spaces it looks as if things are breaking apart this was a probably a wall connecting and that's broken then again there are probably connections which have been broken so some damage has happened right and that is what happens emphysema is a kind of an irreversible damage to the airway so what do you think is your microscopy going to look like are you going to have like proper round alveoli no you'll say even the alveolar walls are going to break like this so how does it look like here you go so just imagine this entire thing was supposed to be one intact alveoli and can you see all the walls are broken all the bits and pieces of those walls are broken so you call them floating septa that's a question that you get in the exam which disease shows you the formation of floating septa or the presence of floating septa and that is emphysema well done with one disease what are the next set of images that you have a very common disease and that is bronchial asthma so first i want to give you a little bit of an uh, you know outline into what pictures will i be showing to you so whenever i'm talking about bronchial asthma everyone knows that an asthmatic patient will have a lot of sputum production so what do you do you take that sputum s for sputum s for saccomano you fix that sputum in a fixative known as saccomano fixative and then you take it up for microscopic examination simple so what do you do from an asthmatic patient if you take the sputum you fix it in a fixative called saccomano fixative and then you go ahead with the seeing it under the microscope you'll see the three c's now what are the three c's guys that's very important for us to know know the names first we have c for charcot laden crystals then we have c for cereola bodies and c for kirschman spiral that is why we call them three c's let's see them one by one so if you notice over here we have this long crystal and shorter version also a little shorter version version an even shorter version of the same so when i say charcot laden crystal it's going to look like a crystal and i think everyone knows what is it made up of the composition of charcot laden crystal is galactin 10 when i say galactin 10 which cell does galactin 10 come from it comes from an eosinophil so what is it made up of galactin 10 coming to the next c the next c is the cereola bodies what are cereola bodies cells and cells have made a cluster which cells you can see lots of cells have made a cluster here lots of cells have made a cluster here so what are cereola bodies cereola bodies are defined as a cluster of the airway epithelial cells they just get together and they form a cluster which is known as cereola bodies the third c that we have is known as the kirschman spiral everyone can appreciate a nice spiral being formed over here and please remember a kirschman spiral is nothing but a spiral of mucus so in the sputum all the mucus that is being cuffed up that mucus is nothing but this spiral formation that is happening so repeating what are the three c's there's a crystal known as charcot laden crystal there's a collection of cells known as cereola bodies and there's a spiral known as kirschman spiral that is what you see in the sputum cytology of asthma let's move on to the next disease the next disease is the one for which the antigen till date is not known and that disease is sarcoidosis i think when we were discussing images decoded of the second chapter that is granulomas i did teach you the two type of granulomas that sarcoidosis shows you what is the most common one does it show you uh, caseating commonly or non caseating so i hope you remember non caseating granulomas are more common in comparison to caseating granulomas see both can be seen but the more common one is a non caseating granuloma the second feature is that sarcoidosis shows us a naked granuloma what do i mean by that usually like if you consider a granuloma of say tuberculosis right so i'll just write it down as granuloma if this is a granuloma of tuberculosis all of you know that the granuloma is surrounded by a collar of cells what collar of cells the granuloma will be surrounded by a collar of lymphocytes so it's it's like a collar it's like a clothing right there is a lymphocytic collar that is present whereas when i'm talking about a granuloma that you're seeing for sarcoidosis do you see this lymphocytic collar no 
Please remember, it's just one granuloma. It has no lymphocytes around it. The lymphocytic collar is absent. So I can say the clothing is absent. And that is the reason that we refer to a sarcoid granuloma as a naked granuloma. Why do we call it so? Because the lymphocytic collar is absent. So number one, it shows us a non-cagiating granuloma. Number two, it shows us a naked granuloma. And then there are a couple of bodies that we get to see. So I'll show you the pictures directly. The first one is an asteroid body. So if I look at this huge cell over here, what is this? You'll say it's a huge cell. It's a giant cell. And one, two, three, four, does it have 10, 12 nuclei? Yes, it's a multinucleated giant cell. And inside the giant cell, I see two stars out here. These are asteroid bodies. So please remember, asteroid body is seen within the giant cell. Within, again and again, I'm repeating. If an asteroid body is seen intracellular in location, what disease will you think of? You will think of sarcoidosis that's the rule okay so if it is seen within the cell you will think of sarcoidosis and is there any other condition where you see the same star like thing but there's no giant cell out here here the asteroid body is totally outside the cell and there's a fungal organism which shows you an extracellular asteroid body and that is sporothrix shenkai. I think this is a mycology question that all of you have seen in your previous year papers and you know it's important. So how have I learnt it? Asteroid means star-shaped, right? So SSS, star-shaped bodies are seen in sarcoidosis and sporothrix, star, sarcoid, sporothrix. But in sarcoid, it's inside the cell and in sporothrix, it is outside the cell. What other body does sarcoidosis show me? Shawman bodies. What are Shawman bodies? See again, this is what? This is a huge cell, so I'll say this is a giant cell. It's got lots of blue color nuclei, so I'll say it is a multinucleated giant cell. And it's got these blue color whorls. So what do we call them? They are known as Shawman bodies. So please remember, when I'm saying Shawman, S4 it is seen in sarcoidosis and C4 it is made up of calcium. So if someone asks you the composition of a Shawman body, this blue blue material, it is made up of calcium. Coming to the third body that is known as the Hamakazi Wiesenberg bodies. Some people just call it HW bodies. And please remember, these are these pigmented brownish color bodies that you're seeing. The Hamakazi Wiesenberg bodies are made up of hemolipofuscin, means it's a kind of a mixture pigment. Little bit of lipofuscin, little bit of hemosiderin, it's a combo pigment. That's why it has this nice brown color. This is known as the Hamakazi Wiesenberg bodies. One more bodies that you see in sarcoidosis are lamellar bodies. You won't get a picture for it, but I've written it for your completion. So please remember, we've got a total of four bodies that you had to learn. Number one, you've got asteroid bodies, the star one, Shawman bodies, the calcium one, or the Hamakazi Wiesenberg bodies, the brown color ones, and then the lamellar bodies. Well, having done sarcoidosis, now let's move on to another group of disorders, the ones which is related to occupation. So this is the very, very famous dumbbell-shaped body which everyone knows, right? So the dumbbell-shaped is always an asbestos, always an asbestos body. So let us talk about it. So first, asbestos is asbestos body. Number one question, dumbbell-shaped. What does it comprise of? So there will obviously be, a, it's you're calling it asbestos body. So there has to be an asbestos fiber. There you have the asbestos fiber. And what is it covered with? It is covered with iron. So when we inhale asbestos fiber, our body covers iron around it, deposits iron around it. So can I also call an asbestos body as a ferruginous body because it is covered with iron? So if I have to pick up iron, what is the special stain that I use? The special stain for iron is Prussian blue. So can you see why is the dumbbell-shaped body coming blue in color? Because what stain have I used? We've used the Prussian blue or the pearls stain. So remember, asbestos body, ferruginous body, because we cover it with iron, special stain, pearl stain. 
Okay, since we're talking about occupations, uh, what group of disorders does this come under? This is pneumoconiosis, right? Occupational hazards. So we are talking about pneumoconiosis. What is the most common pneumoconiosis? The most common one? That's the next one. The most common pneumoconiosis is silicosis. So, uh, you know, you must have seen in uh, silica, this is seen in the glass industry, right? Silica, silica is inhaled in the glass industry. So, imagine you have the lung of a patient who's suffering from, who suffered from silicosis and you want to highlight the silica fibers. How do you do that? You do that by means of which microscopy, can you see something shining over here? These are all the silica deposits and you do that with the help of polarizing microscopy so remember if you want to see the silica deposits in the lung polarizing microscopy is what is going to help you coming to the next group of disorders so uh, pretty much when you're talking about the pneumoconiosis uh, theory is a lot but images are limited let's move on to the next group of disorders and we are starting with a little bit of pneumonias so the first one that you have over here is you will say that fine over here, these linings were supposed to be the alveoli. All these linings that I am seeing, see have a look at this, this was supposed to be one empty white alveoli. This was supposed to be one alveoli, this was supposed to be one, this was one and they were supposed to be totally clear. They were supposed to look something like this because they were supposed to have a lot of air inside it. But now instead of having air inside it, it's got lot of congestion means red blood cells it's got a lot of inflammatory cells so obviously this is a case of infection and this is a case of pneumonia so please remember because all the alveoli are filled with inflammatory cells with congestion this is a case of pneumonia probably a case of typical pneumonia the one that is caused by bacteria strepto staph so this is a typical pneumonia now, there are some uh, different type of pneumonias that you have and one of them shows you this. I'm sure everyone has heard of something known as COP or BOOP. What is that? The new name is cryptogenic organizing pneumonia. Cryptogenic organizing pneumonia, also known as bronchiolitis obliterans with organizing pneumonia. So, it's basically an organizing pneumonia, later stage. Organizing pneumonia will always show you some kind of fibrous plugs. These fibrous, because it's organizing, it's resolving, it's organizing, it will show you fibrous plugs and these fibrous plugs are known as mason bodies. So have a look at the picture over here. See, this was supposed to be one empty looking alveoli. So this was supposed to be that air filled empty looking alveoli but I can see a lot of fibrous tissue that is present over here. So that is what they are saying. When you see the presence of loose fibrous tissue, you definitely know that you are dealing with a case of mason bodies and mason bodies are something that you see in a case of cop or boop that is cryptogenic organizing pneumonia or bronchiolitis obliterans with organizing pneumonia. Well, guys, before I proceed further and I go on to, you know, all the different types of uh, other pneumonia that I have to teach you, I think we've come at that stage of our images decoded where we can talk about all the different masons that we have studied in pathology up till now. So, well, starting from today itself, today we've studied something known as mason body and mason body is seen in a condition known as cryptogenic organizing pneumonia or bronchiolitis obliterans with organizing pneumonia. Other than that, we had two stains for mason and one is known as mason fontana and the other is known as mason trichrome. So well, out of all of these, I think everyone remembers that mason fontana, tan means melanin. Mason fontana is a stain for melanin. And when we are talking about mason trichrome, this is was this was the tri, this was the three color stain. Means the three color stain is going to give muscle what color? Muscle mister. Muscle mister. Muscle is going to get a red color. Then on the other hand, when we had to use collagen, that was the main use I taught you. Collagen is going to get a blue color. And then what is every nucleus going to get? Every nucleus is going to get a blue color black 
color. So see, you can see three colors in front of you, red, blue and black. All the nuclei are black, collagen is blue, muscle is red, mister. So these are all the three masons that we had to know. Mason Fontana, Mason Trichrome and Mason Body, which we just saw here. This was the loose fibrous plug. Now, having said that, we have a couple of other pneumonias also that you must know. Well, there's something known as this kind of a pneumonia where this was one entire alveoli and it's not filled with air. If you see this alveoli, it's filled with some cells and a nucleus, cell and a nucleus, cell and a nucleus, right? So these are some kind of cells and these cells are not having pink cytoplasm. They're having a very foamy cytoplasm. These are all vacuolated macrophages and why are they vacuolated because they have a lot of lipid why do they have lipid or if they have lipid then what is the pneumonia known as this kind of a pneumonia is known as lipoid pneumonia this kind of a pneumonia is known as lipoid pneumonia. It is seen in those patients who are working in mineral oil industries. That's usually the kind of history that is given to us. Patients who are working in mineral oil industry with the inhalation of the fumes and the oil that is around it, they end up having all that oily, oily, fatty material enter their lungs. They are eaten up by the macrophages and that is why you are seeing all these white, white color macrophages, the white, white dots. Those are all vacuolated macrophages which contain lipid. So, will lipoid pneumonia be positive for a lipidaceous stain? Yes, lipoid pneumonia will be positive for oil red O. Well, having said that, now let's move on to the next one. Are there any kind of infectious and uh, fungal related pneumonias for which you get pictures? Very well, yes. So, I can show you. These are all the causes, but the pictures that I want to show you are for these so, the first one in terms of pneumonia caused by fungal organism is histoplasma. Everyone knows histoplasma is a dimorphic fungus. So, it definitely one of the form that it shows me is a yeast form. And yeast form looks just like a dot because yeast form is more like, uh, you know, it's only 2 to 4 microns. So, you understand the size of it is going to be just similar to a dot. Can you see this one tiny dot here, one tiny dot here and multiple over here. They are studied. This slide is studied with lots and lots of histoplasma. So yes, yeast form 2 to 4 microns. Coming to the next pneumonia that can be caused by blastomyces. First and foremost, what is this stain? In fungus, when we are dealing with black color stains, the name of those stains is Gomori methanamine silver stain. Gomori methanamine silver stain. And uh, let me tell you that whenever, or in fact, you guys know this, whenever we use the word silver, black color has to come. So what is the shape I see over here? I see an eight shape. So that is what they ask you. B for blastomyces, B looks like an eight. So this shows you figure of eight appearance. That is an important question that you get in the exam. Coming to the next one, that is this. So what do you see out here? I see these long, long hyphae. So, I'll try to draw those. I see these really long and thin hyphae and in some places they are showing me branching. They are showing me branching. What kind of branching? So, if this is hyphae then this is branching out like this. Okay, then this is this one is also branching out over here like this. So, basically I'm seeing acute angle branching, right? That is what I'm seeing. Number one, I'm seeing acute angle branching. Number two, I want to know that are these septae empty or are they showing me lines? So, let me tell you, they are showing you lines. You can see the lines being highlighted over here. So, are they septed or are they aseptate? They are definitely septate. So, when I have acute angle branching and septate hyphae, I think of aspergillus. And what is my mnemonic for aspergillus? A for acute angle branching. SP for septate. So, aspergillus A for acute angle branching and SP for septate. Compare this with the next one. Compare it with mucor. So, mucor is everything opposite. If uh, aspergillus was acute angle branching, mucor is going to be, if I highlight it, it's a perpendicular, complete perpendicular right angle branching. If aspergillus had lines, it was septate. Mucor is totally clean. It is aseptate. Further, 
mucor take m and r mucor is if they ask you which is broader aspergillus or mucor you will say m for mucor mucor is motor and ribbon like mucor is the broader one the motor one which is ribbon like so you can very well see the width look at the width of this fungus it's quite thick right versus look at aspergillus aspergillus was quite thin so mucor is the motor and the ribbon one okay having said that now let's move on to the next one and that is this again a little blackish color outline has come so what stain have i used when you are using the black color we are talking about gomori methanamine silver stain and what do i see out here i have an organism some of those organisms are looking round okay then i look further this is also looking round in some places the organism is looking a little crushed over here also it's looking crushed in fact here it's looking more like a hat so lots of names given some people because they look round they call it ping pong ball because they look a little crushed it is called crushed ball sometimes it also looks like a hat it's all about imagination sometimes one of the organisms is crushed one of the organisms is round so it looks like a cup and saucer so lot of imaginary things that have been labeled for this and which organism as am i all in all talking about i am talking about pneumocystis carinae so please remember guys pneumocystis carinae infection is something that you sh that shows you and in fact this is the most important stain gms which shows you the crushed ping pong ball and cup and saucer and hat appearance okay having said that now moving on to the next there are one or two miscellaneous disorders uh, actually two three of them and then we'll move on to all the tumors that you have to know so first talking about the miscellaneous disorder i think this one has gained a lot of importance especially after covid as well that is you have an alveoli over here and okay in the center it's all white and just like it's supposed to be but the wall of the alveoli is covered with a pink color membrane and what is this disease known as this is known as the hyaline membrane disease this is known as the hyaline membrane disease okay well having said that i hope all of you know that hyaline membrane disease can happen in children also and then hyaline membrane disease can happen in adults as well right so when it happens in adults it is known as what adult respiratory distress syndrome adult respiratory distress syndrome also known as acute lung injury ali also known as acute lung injury adult respiratory distress syndrome or hyaline membrane disease and what is this dirty membrane made up of this pink color membrane what is the composition of it see it's lung injury respiratory distress all the cells are going to be more or less dead there's dead debris which makes up this entire hyaline membrane coming to the next disease i'm sure everyone has heard of something called as pap what is pap it stands for pulmonary alveolar proteinosis pulmonary alveolar proteinosis is a disease in which there's a problem in the surfactant clearance surfactant is the issue over here right and all of you what do you need to do today i've not given you a homework up till now so today's homework is a little bit on the tougher side you need to tell me what are the genetic mutations associated with pulmonary alveolar proteinosis the genetic mutations is what you're going to point out to me well having said that what do you see in pulmonary alveolar proteinosis you will have these alveoli but this time i hope you can see they are full of the surfactant material they are full of this pink color material and that is why you call it, it looks proteinaceous pink in color so lung alveoli have proteinaceous material pulmonary alveolar proteinosis and what does the electron microscopy show you it shows you something known as the lamellar bodies or lamellations in the pneumocytes lining of the alveoli are pneumocytes right so in the pneumocytes you see that round and round lamellations or lamellar bodies and they ask you that you know this looks just like you remember in the first chapter cell injury something like this that we saw was um, known as myelin figures so how will you not get confused in the exam look at this in a lamellar body the center will be very dense there's a center dot black color 
and then the periphery is a little loose see the peripheral layers are a little loose that is how you'll identify the lamellations in pulmonary alveolar proteinosis there's a dense center and then there are loose loose layers on the periphery okay so couple of miscellaneous disorders that we are doing one more miscellaneous disorder that occurs is i'm sure everyone has heard of something known as amniotic fluid embolism so you know that although it's rare but if it happens the mortality is pretty high so when we are talking about amniotic fluid embolism this is a picture that is there in most of the standard textbooks like harrison and in this what do we see these are two pulmonary arteries so this is a mother who has died and this is an autopsy that has been done this is a mother who has died of amniotic fluid embolism this mother suddenly collapses and dies of amniotic fluid embolism and after that you have taken her lungs for an autopsy so when you do an autopsy you see these are two pulmonary arteries these are two small in fact branches of pulmonary artery arterioles and they are filled with this pink material so this is one arteriole and this is one arteriole they are filled with these whorls of pinkish material what are these pinkish material these are the keratin flakes these are nothing but you can call them swirls of keratin and where did they come from you'll say ma'am this is the pulmonary artery of the mother how did the mother's pulmonary artery artery it's supposed to have blood how does it have keratin where is it come from obviously amniotic fluid has reached the mother's lungs that is why she suddenly collapsed and died amniotic fluid has reached and amniotic fluid obviously carries the child's uh, skin cells the hair so all of that has also entered into her lungs and that is why she suddenly collapsed and that is the reason it has such a high mortality so yes when you identify pulmonary arteries with these swirls of keratin it's a case of amniotic fluid embolism versus if i say this is an autopsy of a pulmonary artery with white white material and this white white material is oil red o positive you'll say okay so this time in the pulmonary artery and the branches we've got fat that is sitting so which embolism does it become this is known as fat embolism and what is the reason for fat embolism how did the fat reach the pulmonary artery this usually happens after fracture of a long bone fracture of a long bone like fracture of a femur or any road traffic accident that resulted in fracture the fat from that bone will enter into the pulmonary circulation and that can result in fat embolism so you know with that all the tiny tiny miscellaneous disorders are done now what do we need to go in for now we need to go in for the tumors first before i get to the main two three cancers i'll take up a few tumors the first one being this it's a carcinoid tumor carcinoid tumor i hope everyone can recall it is a neuroendocrine disorder it's not a carcinoma it's a neuroendocrine tumor so what do i see over here over here i see this is a you know a bronchoscopy that is being performed and if i look at the epithelium it's looking nice smooth over here also the epithelium is looking fine so it's not something which is a carcinoma it's not epithelial tumor something from below is coming up and that is probably i can only you know suspect probably something other than a carcinoma probably a carcinoid but then when i do a biopsy of this and when i look at it under the microscope what is the pattern that a carcinoid shows me it shows me one nest one nest then it shows me another nest it shows me another nest so that is a very classical pattern known as the nesting pattern which is not only classical of carcinoid let me tell you any neuroendocrine tumor of the body shows you the same nesting pattern so the first tumor is carcinoid which looks like this mass then you have uh, the nesting pattern but the final diagnosis is going to be with the help of markers so you will have to do immunohistochemistry so today uh, because now after this we won't be meeting on saturday and sunday for images decoded so i have to you know give you good amount of homework so one homework that i gave you were the genetic alterations of pulmonary alveolar proteinosis the second homework i'm giving you is the entire 
immunohistochemical profile of a neuroendocrine tumor so these two homeworks you need to type in the comments below and yes over the weekend i'll be answering you on the same Having said that, there is another tumor in the lung known as sugar tumor. So, first way of identifying sugar tumor, you will only and only see the presence of clear cells. Only clear cells are noted. So, you can very well see all the cells are white, totally white. That is a sugar tumor. And this tumor on immunohistochemistry is HMB45 positive. Guys, I hope you remember sugar tumor actually belongs to a family of tumors that is known as picomas. A lot of tumors come under picomas in different different organs. You have tumors in the kidney, tumors in the lung. So the tumor in the lung which comes under the family of picomas is the sugar tumor. It shows you clear cells and it is HMB45 positive. These are all small, small miscellaneous tumors. Let's come to the main tumor, the tumor of the lung or the cancer of the lung, which shows me these beautiful KPs, that is keratin pearls, yes. So when we see the presence of keratin pearls, we know it is a case of squamous cell carcinoma. Versus, if I start showing you the presence of glands in a tumor, any tumor showing you the presence of these glands, I know when I am seeing glands, I am dealing with a case of adenocarcinoma. However, I know this is not adenocarcinoma of any organ. This is not of colon. This is not of the endometrium. This is definitely lungs. And what gives me that confidence, guys, of calling this the uh, adenocarcinoma of the lung? Because I can see a lot of black color pigment over here. So when I'm seeing black color pigment, obviously, the for obvious reasons, the black color pigment that you have has to be carbon. So that gives me, a, you know, a double sure that definitely this is from the lung that has been taken and a tumor with glands. So this is adenocarcinoma and I've done a brown color stain. What is the brown color stain in pathology known as immunohistochemistry? So quickly revising for all of you that when we are dealing with adenocarcinoma of the lung, adenocarcinoma of the lung immunohistochemistry has been an all-time favorite question. So the immunohistochemistry is TTF1, MUC1 and Napsin A positive. How do I learn this? TTF1 positive. MUC1 positive, Napsin A. So A for adenocarcinoma, Napsin A. And A is the first alphabet, right? So TTF, all the 1, 1 and AA things will come under it. Adenocarcinoma is positive for TTF1, MUC1, Napsin A. So yes, these, whether I put TTF1 or I put MUC1 or I put Napsin A, I'll get this brown color staining. So squamous cell carcinoma, keratin pearls, adenocarcinoma glands. But before someone has adenocarcinoma, like this is like end stage, right? This is patient has had cancer. Is there any precursor to an adenocarcinoma? Yes. Precursor to adenocarcinoma is adenocarcinoma in situ. I'll write it up for you. It's a very favorite question nowadays. Precursor for adenocarcinoma is adenocarcinoma in situ, which was earlier known as bronchoalveolar carcinoma. Still now, the examiner sometimes, sometimes, you know, likes to use this word bronchoalveolar carcinoma. But technically, the better word that we have now is adenocarcinoma in situ, because in situ tells me that it's not a proper cancer, it's a precursor lesion. And what do I see in it? For example, if this is one alveoli, I'll trace it entirely out for you. This entire thing is an alveoli. So where do you see the tumor? Do you see it infiltrating here and there? No. You'll say the tumor cells are just sitting on the alveolar wall. They are not going anywhere else. They are only sitting on the alveolar wall. Are they here? No. Are they here? No. Are they going infiltrating here and there? No. They are just sitting on the alveolar wall. This appearance is known as the picket fence or the butterfly on fence appearance. Means like butterflies, they are just sitting on a fence. They are just sitting on a fence like butterflies. So what does adenocarcinoma in situ or bronchoalveolar carcinoma show us? Butterfly on fence or picket fence appearance. Now this is all about squamous and adeno and its precursors. The last tumor that you have in carcinoma is the 
is the small cell carcinoma. Now, small cell carcinoma shows you a couple of interesting findings. The first one is actually this. I think everyone can appreciate that there's this huge blood vessel. So, I've drawn a blood vessel here. But the color of the blood vessel is not looking nice and pink. The color of the blood vessel is looking bluish. So, tell me why has the blood vessel or what is this known as? The blood vessel has become bluish in color. So, this is known as the azopardi effect. So, now my question to you will be why is the uh, blood vessel becoming blue? So, you will say that ma'am look at the cells around it. The cells that you have around it are very, very weak cells. They are very weak cells and they are kind of smudging. Can you see? With a little bit of pressure from each other, they are smudging out like ink smudges out. So, all of these that I see, these are the smudged tumor cells. Please remember, it's the smudged tumor cells that give the azopardi effect appearance. All the tumor cells are smudged out and they give that so, I'll call this indirectly, can I say, this bluish discoloration is because of tumor cell smudging or in other words is because of DNA, the DNA that is coming from the tumor cells. So, I have a small question for all of you. Is there any special stain which can help me identify DNA? The special stain which will tell me, yes, that definitely this blue color is DNA and nothing else and the name of that stain is the Fulgen stain which I'm sure all of you already know. So when I talk about azopardi effect, you will say okay azopardi effect is that the vessel has become blue in color. Why has the vessel become blue in color? Because all the tumor cells have smudged over it, all the DNA has come over it. Prove it that it is a DNA. To prove it that it is a DNA, I use the Fulgen stain. I hope you remember the mnemonic, gen, generations. What passes on in generations? DNA passes on in generations. So, what is the mnemonic? Stain for DNA, generation stain, fuel gen stain. So, definitely I have learned one thing. Azopardi effect is something that I will be seeing in small cell carcinoma. Another thing that I will be seeing in small cell carcinoma is the salt and pepper chromatin. So, pick up any one, uh, you know, nucleus of your choice you will see that uh, the nucleus is not going to have, uh, you know, a very, I cannot draw it like this. It's not, the nucleus is not looking entirely blue. No. You will say the nucleus has some blue areas, some white areas. Blue, white, blue, white, blue, white. So, basically dark light, dark light, just like salt and pepper, black and white, salt and pepper. So, small cell carcinoma, number one, has azopardi effect. Number two, has presence of salt and pepper chromatin. Well, guys, with that, your carcinomas are done. Now, what do we have to go in for? Now, we have to go in for one last thing and... Uh, Yes, one last thing that we have to go in for, I'm sorry for the small technical uh, issue that is happening. Yes, but the last thing that we have to go in for is these two tumors. Now, what are these two tumors? Over here, I see something known as a black and white picture, guys. When I see a black and white picture, I clearly know that I'm dealing with electron microscopy, right? So, when I say I'm dealing with electron microscopy, I have one picture on the left and one on the right. If I try to highlight, over here I see some microvilli. I see some microvilli. Now, uh, you know, these microvilli are very short. So, can I say they are very short microvilli and are they showing me any branching? No. You will say these microvilli are non-branching. They are non-branching. So, which tumor of the lung shows you non-branching microvilli and that tumor of the lung is known as adenocarcinoma. That tumor of the lung is known as adenocarcinoma. So, how will we learn it? Adenocarcinoma shows you no branching. Adenocarcinoma shows you no branching. Versus, if you look at the microvilli here, they are branching and going on and on all over. Multiple branches are happening. So, if I ask you which of them shows me long branching microvilli, which of them shows me long branching microvilli, your answer is going to be mesothelioma. So, that is how we differentiate. What is mesothelioma? Mesothelioma is a tumor of the pleura. It's not in the lung, it's not inside the lung, it's around, it's in the pleura. So, mesothelioma will show you long branching microvilli. 
mesothelioma, long branching microvilli and adenocarcinoma will show you no branching. It will show you non-branching microvilli. Well guys, also with that we come to the end of this session and we are done with our, uh, you know, with our study of uh, whatever we had to. So respiratory path is done for us and I am very sorry for that last uh, one minute of technical issue that happened. But yes, having said that, done for the day and now we will be meeting tomorrow for a special class that is on the Unacademy app at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. So a typical lunch time uh, to keep you away from sleeping and then we'll be back to our Monday to Friday scheduler that I told you in the beginning the trio classes morning 7 30 afternoon 3 and evening 9 o'clock the next topic in images decoded we'll be starting with the two classes of renal pathology okay thank you so much for joining in have a great weekend and see you on Monday uh, for this next next episode in this series thank you and good night